All right, we're going to introduce our kind of ideas of probability, and we, we just start with some vocabulary uh, around the, the, the words we're going to use uh, primarily through this chapter. So the key with all of this is, is that it's random, uh, and so all of this deals on things having some randomized chance. Once you have actual choices involved where people can affect an outcome, uh, all of these probabilities uh, in terms of our principles fall apart. So... Uh, once we set a likelihood of something, then we assume that that stays fixed and that we have some randomness in there uh, to deal with all of this. So uh, some examples that you're going to be used to are we can toss a coin, we can roll a dice. Uh, so a pair of dice, right? We uh, have trials where we toss one coin or one roll of a dice, and then we have outcomes that come out of that. So if you flip one coin, that's a trial. Your outcome could be heads or tails. And again, we're not going to worry about something leaning on its side. Um, so we can list our outcomes. So if we had uh, the ways that I could get a 5, well, I could get a 1 and a 4, right? Or I could get a 2 and a 3. Uh, I can't get a 0 and a 5, so that's not going to work because uh, the lowest number I'm getting is 1. But I also have to worry about uh, the other way it could go. So I have to track these things separately. So while it's the same numeric outcome, getting a 1 on the first die and then a 4 on the second die, even though those still would add to 5, we have to treat those as different outcomes. Um, those are a different way to get there. So I have four of these things uh, that I could get a 5. So if we wanted to visualize this, we really have kind of two uh, ways we can go about that. The first is with uh, like a tree diagram. So we could say I, I roll the first one and I have six things that come out of it. So those are just my numbers on the die, right? And then each of those I could roll again uh, and I'd have another six outcomes. And right off the bat that gets a little unwieldy. Um, you know, we have these large branches and it's tricky to keep track of what we have, but we could trace things and we could figure out the ways that we get a five, right, uh, would be the lists that we have over here. So we can list it, we can have a tree diagram, uh, those are the four ways it would work, right? And it's 4 out of 36. Another way to do this is with an area model. And so an area model, uh, we start with something that's one by one, and the area is one square unit. And that's going to be important for our probability down the road. But we basically divide this area up into uh, our... Uh, potential outcomes for each piece. So we have uh, our first roll and our second roll, and I could get a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, and a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, and that represents all the possibilities that I could get uh, for rolling two die. Now obviously this would fall apart a little bit with three, we'd have to go three dimensions, and four we'd run out of spatial dimensions, but we start to visualize things uh, and see kind of where these things come from. Now it's easy to see those are my fives, those are the four fives, and my total probability would then be four out of 36, and that would be my chance. So we have uh, 36 ways it could all work, so the probability of our five is the four out of 36, or one ninth, and that's kind of where we're going. You've seen this stuff before in previous classes, and we build on it here uh, in our, our pre-calc class. So uh, this is our, our definition of probability, right? So we have some probability of an event, uh, this is not P times E. Uh, it's, it's a probability of some event happening, and that event is uh, the number of outcomes right over the number of outcomes in the sample space. So this is our kind of favorable outcomes versus our total outcomes that we could have. So um, this is basically, in general, kind of what we want over the total ways that something could come out. And so there's different ways we can go about this, but this is our, our fundamental kind of uh, end point, the hard part of all of this is getting the number part, getting those to be correct. So uh, we can toss a coin, that's going to be uh, our event, right? Uh, each time we toss it is a trial. This would take uh, six trials, you'd have to toss it six times, right? And then we could list the entire things in the sample space. So heads, tails, heads, heads, all of them, we could list all of the different ways it could work. Um, and again, this is our, our random piece, right? Uh, not always likely that they're always going to be the same, but if we were to divide this up, right, we'd have the same probability of getting a heads and a heads as a heads and a tail. Um, it's not something that is skewed one way or the other. Um, so we can ask questions that way. What's the probability of getting an equal number of heads and tails over six trials? Well, there's my heads and my tails, right? I could break this out this way. And I can see each of those is one-fourth, of the area, right? So it's a one in four chance of getting heads and heads. 
and those are the same number of heads and tails. So 50% chance for one trial. All right, so 50% chance for one, does that mean I have a 50% chance for six? And so we have to think about what does that mean for six trials? Well, we can make our sample space. So we start to look at our coin number two, coin number two, and then we're going to flip it six times. All right, so we could have six heads and then six heads here for coin one and coin two, all right? And then I can go through all of the different variations, and we can see I could have one tail, right? And then I could have six heads, and then I could have two tails, and I could have six heads and three tails, right? And so on and so forth. And by the end, right, we would have way too many things. So what if we had four coins and ten trials, right? We're not going to want to make a list. Uh, you know, what if we had four dice? and a thousand trials, right? We're obviously, we're not going to make a list as we go through this. So the list idea falls apart pretty quickly in terms of tracking our, our sample space and our outcomes. So we have to think of another way to kind of count objects. And so we have our counting principles um, that we can use here. So this builds from our fundamental counting principle. And what this is, is that we multiply the number of outcomes for each event. And so we look at each event, and then we just multiply all those events together, and that's how many different ways we could do something. So let's say we had um, a seven-digit phone number possible that bring up with another other than zero or one and can't have any repeats in the last four digits. So we think about, all right, I have ten digits total, except I can't have a zero or a one to start with. So I have my seven digits for my number, right? There's eight possibilities here because I take out from the ten, the zero, and the one, right? And then for the second number, I have all 10 digits back in, so I can use all those 10. And then I have 10 digits again. And then the last ones, I can't repeat any of the last four digits, so I still have 10 choices, but now I can't use one of them. I have 9, and then I have 8, and then I have 7. So those are all the outcomes for each of the different numbers, and then to get the total number of outcomes, I multiply them together, and I get uh, around 3 million uh, different phone numbers that I can have. Uh, with those restrictions on it. Alright, so that's how we use the counting principle. And then we're often asked how do we do things with an AND or an OR. So an AND event, right, is that uh, both events will occur, right, so I could get uh, that they would have an 8 and an 8 and an 8 or something like that. An OR event would be something that one or the other can occur. They don't both have to happen. Um, and so to deal with that we have to worry about whether events uh, affect future outcomes, that would mean that they're independent, or if they're dependent, where they, uh, sorry, independent is they do not affect future outcomes, and dependent is where they do affect future outcomes. Um, so often there's examples of marbles being drawn from a bag and whether you replace the marble or not, uh, but basically you're talking about whether if I do something, does that change the chances of something else happening down the road? Uh, and we'll we'll do those uh, a lot as we go forward. All right. Uh, so if I looked at a coin, right, with our six chances, I would want to know the number of outcomes with each of those. There's four. There's four. There's four. There's four. There's four. And there's four. So those are the total different ways that you could flip uh, the two coins, right, with dealing with our heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, heads, whatever it was, uh, and then we'd multiply those out, and we get four to the six, and that would be our sample space and looking at how many of those have the same number of heads and tails. Um, so if we look at these, uh, in general, independent is easier. So if I flip a coin and get heads, that doesn't change the chance of getting tails down the road. Uh, and it's often called the gambler's fallacy on something like a, a roulette wheel. Just because you land on red a couple of times doesn't mean that you are uh, then set to land on black. They don't have any um, influence on what happens next. Everything is equally likely every time through. Uh, these ones are harder, again, like if you select something, if I'm uh, getting four people to make a team out of 20 people, as soon as I select that first person, I'm changing the probability for everybody else uh, of being selected. Um, and so we have some um, questions that we can ask, right? So we have uh, summer camp participants get to participate in a morning and afternoon activity. They can choose an indoor activity or an outdoor activity in the afternoon. And the question, does selecting one event affect the likelihood of the other events, right? And so if they can choose a different activity, right, then that would uh, be uh, dependent, except if they can choose the same again, then it would be independent. So it matters on what 
do we do with the restrictions here? Um, so in this case, we would say they'd be independent, right? If uh, those uh, they don't, the indoor activity and the outdoor activity don't overlap. Now, on the second one, they need to choose a second indoor activity for the afternoon, which means they can't choose the same thing that they had before. Uh, so they're given the rain, the, the probability of outdoor is X, right? And then given rain, the probability of being something outdoor is now zero, which means that you have no um, you have no chance of doing anything outdoor, right? So this would be uh, a rain and outdoor are dependent variables. So having something rain changes the likelihood of uh, an outdoor thing being selected. Um, if we had a different indoor activity, right, that would mean that basically we're taking something out. We're changing the sample space, the number of things you can choose from, and so that would be a dependent um, restriction on those two things. So again, it's context-specific, um, and you have to be a little bit careful about how it works. And the reason why is because we have two properties here. So we have um, our uh, independent events. We have an AND operator. So if it's independent and the two things we want them to be um, an AND, we just multiply the probability. So the probability of A times the probability of B is the probability of A and B. For dependent events, it's the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B given that A has happened. All right? Another way to think about it is that B after A. And so we have to, this probability of B depends on what happened with A. And so that's different than this where it just happens no matter what happened with A, B would have some chance. So you got to be a little bit careful um, given how these two works. All right. And now we have things that can either overlap or not overlap. Mutually exclusive events uh, means that they exclude each other. There's no overlap between them. Uh, Non-mutually exclusive means there's two things that could fulfill both of the requirements. And for or, we add these. So A or B, if they don't overlap, is just the addition of the two. And A or B, given that they do overlap, is the addition of the two minus the overlap. And if we draw a Venn diagram, that's more helpful here. So these overlap, and so if I want to figure out the values of mutually exclusive, I just add up the two circles, and for this one, I subtract off the intersection. And here's some couple of examples to look at. So, uh, I can have a heart is drawn from a deck, it's a heart or a diamond, those do not overlap. You can't have a card that's a heart and a diamond at the same time, so those are mutually exclusive. A queen or a diamond, there are going to be cards that are both a queen and a diamond. It's called the queen of diamond, right? So there's the queen of diamonds, and then there's the other ones. Uh, and so this has some overlap. We would not want to double count this card as both a diamond and a queen. So we would want to take away that overlap, that one card that satisfies both. A face card or a black card, right, there are black face cards. And so we'd want to get rid of those, the overlap. We wouldn't want to count those twice. So like the jack of spades wouldn't get counted as a black card and a face card because it's both. So we would take those off. All right. Um, and that is it for our intro here.